Hi there. You may have heard of the adage, you are what you eat. And in today's video segment here, I'm going to explore the corollary to that adage. You also are where you eat. My name is Yelmer Erkins. I'm an archeologist at University of California at Davis. And I'm gonna to talk today about how archeologists use that corollary, you are where you eat, to explore various kinds of interesting things about human behavior in the archeological record. I said, you are where you eat. Well, how does that work? Well, all of the uh, elements that comprise our tissues as humans come from the things that we eat. So we are obligate consumers, meaning that everything that we use to synthesize our bone, our teeth, our skin, our internal organs, everything that's used to synthesize those different tissues has to come from the foods that we eat. This tree is absorbing that those uh, calcium is absorbing sulfur from the soil that gets passed up into uh, the different tissues that the tree forms, including um, this walnut here. Today, of course, most of us get the majority of our food from you know local supermarkets. So this, for example, this tomato field here behind me, the tomatoes get picked, those tomatoes get loaded on trucks, and they might get distributed you know all around the state or maybe even halfway around the world. And so the nutrients that are passed on the tomatoes that then get passed on to uh, humans that eat those tomatoes, those nutrients can come from quite far away. Now, of course, in, the, in our ancestors who were living in much smaller villages, they didn't have mechanized transportation. And so the vast majority of food that they would have been eating would have come from the immediately surrounding area, which means that the local signature from the soils around where they were living would get incorporated into their bones and teeth. So archeologists spend a lot of time constructing what we call isoscapes. And this examines how the isotopes of a particular element vary across a landscape. This is an example here showing two different isotopic systems, one for oxygen and one for strontium, and how the isotope ratios of those particular elements varies across the landscape. So of course, people who are eating food in a particular area then will be incorporating that local signature of strontium, that local signature of oxygen into their bones and teeth. In archeological context, the most common isotopic systems that we use for tracing human mobility are strontium, and then uh, especially strontium, and then to a lesser degree, things like lead, sulfur, and oxygen. Today, of course, most of us live in large urban centers where we live with tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands or even millions of people together. But for most of our human past, we lived in pretty small villages, maybe only 20, 30, or 100 people. And that, of course, posed challenges to human societies. In particular, it created problems for people who wanted to get married. So you can imagine, let's say there was a village like this with maybe 50 people living within its borders, and there's a woman who wants to get married. So looking to start a family, who's in my village? Well, we could take a look at everybody's there. It should be about evenly split between males and females. Of course, if she's looking to start a family, half of those people will be of the same sex and so are not uh, marriageable, uh, are not eligible to be married, um, bringing it down to about 24 people. And then um, of those remaining 24 people, um, maybe a third of them are already married or older. Uh, maybe a third of them are too young, uh, not the right age to be married. And so we can eliminate those people. And now we're down to about eight people. Now of those eight, probably a bunch of these are going to be your direct relatives, your brothers, maybe your cousins, first cousins. And so we can eliminate a bunch of those. And when we do, we're down to maybe two people. And so this creates uh, sometimes a challenge. Maybe you, know, you don't get along with those two people or for whatever other reasons, economic reasons, um, they may not be eligible as marriage partners. So what do you do? You've got to look outside of your village. Now, when people have to move villages, they tend not to do it in a random way, but societies tend to have rules for how they organize these movements between different villages. So we call these post-marital residence systems. If we look cross-culturally at different human societies around the world, we find that about 70% of human societies are what we call patrilocal, which is where the female would move to the husband's village. About 15% of human societies, however, are what we call matrilocal. This is where the male 
moves to the wife's village. And then there are other systems like neolocal, which is where the couple finds an entirely new place to live. This is generally what people do in American society today for economic reasons, they, they move to a new place. And there are other forms too, something called a funky local um, that I won't go into the details of. So as archeologists then, we would like to be able to reconstruct these ancient post-marital residence systems based on signatures that are preserved in teeth and bone. Okay, so how do we go about doing that? One of the neat things about teeth is that they form at different ages in our lives. So for example, let's take a look at the mandible here and a first molar. Uh, this is the permanent first molar. Um, we can take a look at the timing of when the crown starts forming versus when the crown, the enamel, is finished growing. So for a first molar, this begins at about age zero and finishes between two and a half and three years. For a second molar, this, the crown starts forming around two and a half to three years and finishes growing between seven and eight years. And for a third molar, this happens even later, starts between seven and 10 years and finishes between 12 and 16 years. And in fact, the root of the tooth continues growing even long after the crown is complete. But the neat thing there is that as that tooth is growing, it's locking in that signature of where you're living at those different points in time. This is the UC Davis Archaeometry Lab, and this is where we process samples for isotopic analyses. Now, as we've talked about throughout this video, there are, I've talked about how elements from the soil make their way into different human tissues, how different human tissues form at different points in our lives, and then archeologically, how we can then trace where people were living at different points in their lives based on those chemical signatures that get locked into our bones and into our teeth. Now from that, we can start to deduce those postmarital residence patterns. If we see, for example, that it's primarily men who were living in one place as children, but then moved to a different place as adults, we can surmise that that society had a preference for matrilocal postmarital residence patterns. By contrast, if it's primarily females who were living in one place and then were moving, that might indicate that that society had a preference for patrilocality. Now we're interested in all of these things archeologically because we know that there are strong links between matrilocality and patrilocality and things like kinship systems. For example, whether societies are matrilineal or patrilineal. And also it tells us about how different villages were sort of interconnected across the landscape. So there's tremendous insight we can gain about ancient societies through these very types of detailed analyses that we do here in the lab. And that's why I've spent a lot of my career trying to understand those mobility patterns by using these isotopic tracers in bones and teeth.